Good morning, everyone. Ah. Hey. You guys have uh, heard me talk about verse-by-verse -verse teaching and why I enjoy it so much. And this morning, as we get into Luke chapter 11 or proceed, continue on through Luke 11, we have a couple of classic examples why verse-by-verse -verse teaching can be so important, or is so important, should I say. Um, when you're doing a verse-by-verse -verse teaching and you're actually capturing the context, the subject matter, you'll begin to see things in a whole different way. And uh, we have, like I said, there's two, two areas, and we touched upon one last week, which is all commonly referred to as the Lord's Prayer. And then again, this morning, we're going to be looking at another area, uh, which is de describing the eye being the lamp of the body. So we're, we have two examples, and that's why this morning, because um, we want to keep the context, we're going to go back and review, thir do a thorough review of the first several verses there in uh, Luke chapter 11. We're going to look at verse 2. <clears throat> at this point, the disciples had come to Jesus, and they'd asked him, said, Lord, teach us to pray, which I find incredibly amazing that they would come to him and say, Lord, teach us to pray. They didn't come to him and say, Lord, teach us to raise the dead. Or Jesus, teach us to turn water into wine. That would be really cool, turning water into wine. Or walking on water or, you know, uh, opening blind eyes or deaf ears. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. And I think the reason for that is because they've seen how much time he was spending in prayer how much time he was dedicating to prayer to the Father. And I believe they understood that was actually the key to his miraculous life. That was the key to the joy that he was sharing or, you know, reflect, that was reflected in his life, the peace that he had. You know, that was the key to all of his life. They knew that prayer was the number one key. So they come to him and say, Lord, teach us to pray. And again, I want to hit up on a couple of subject matters here as, as we go on. Picking up verse 2, it says, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father. See, what we don't understand and what I'll hope to show you is that this prayer was actually speaking prophetically. They seen how Jesus was praying. They wanted to know how to pray. In Matthew's gospel, he said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Now, he, they weren't talking about the posture of prayer. They said, we want to know how to pray. And so that's, that's, the, that's what Jesus is showing them here. And so he says, and the very first thing he does is say, when you pray, say, Father. That was, that was mind-boggling to them because they, when they viewed God, they didn't view him as a father. They reviewed him as their judge, as their dictator, as the rule maker. And they, they said, look, he says, when you pray, say, Father. Now the interesting thing word about, about the word Father is that, you know, Father's a very formal term. But what Jesus had done is took the formal term and brought a more intimate term together to form a, a, a very intimate word. The, the, the word that's used there is Abba. And, and, and again, it's a combination of a very formal term and a very actually immature term. Father is, you know, it's like, this is my father. It's a formal introduction, I could say. But the word that he uses is Abba, and it brings the words dad, 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 you know, as, you, as a toddler would say, and he brings these two words together. And so what he's saying, when you pray, say daddy. Now, isn't that, that, isn't that special? That's a special relationship. That's a very intimate relationship. I'm coming to my daddy. That should change how you view God, right? Right there alone. They would have been like, say what? <laughs> Go to God and say what? Daddy. So he says, when you pray, say, Daddy, how will be your name? Your kingdom come. And uh, the, the part that uh, Matthew's gospel goes on, it says, your will be done. But verse 3 says, give us each day our daily bread. You didn't give us. Daddy, give us. That's not how you would approach the Father in that day. Because everything you had was God was going to bless, it, bless you with it because you were a good boy or girl. You had to earn it. You had to earn your daily bread in that day. In their mindset, should I say. So it was something you had to earn. He says, give us our daily bread. And, it, and it's like day by day. 
In other words, don't go to your father and say, Father, give us our bread this month or for this year or not even for this week. He says day by day. In other words, if you're going to be praying for your daily bread, what must you do? You've got to go to the Father day by day, each and every day. He wants us to come to Him day by day. And that's one of the things the disciples notice about Jesus. He was, he was constantly praying. <coughs> he'd get up early in the morning, he'd pray throughout the day, and he'd pray late in the evening. He was in this constant relationship with Daddy. And, and then that's what he's saying. Go to Him. In this, in, and seek this, this intimate relationship. And another point I want to focus upon here, and this too shall, should change your relationship. And again, he's coming to disciples pre-cross. He's coming to them pre-cross. And he's going to give them the solution or the, the, the power of prayer at the end of this, um, this section of teaching. But... He, he's, they're coming to him pre-cross. He wanted them to, look, to be looking forward to what is coming. And he says, <clears throat> he says, and, give a, and forgive us our sins, verse 4. And forgive us our sins. Now here's, here's this. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. <clears throat> Keep in mind, this is pre-cross. When, and forgiveness was not a part of their society. It wasn't a part of their thinking. And the, the, the law was about retribution. It was about payback. If you did someone something to someone, well, then you owed <coughs> that person a certain amount. The only part where they understood forgiveness was the year of Jubilee, which every, only came about every 50 years, and then all debt would be forgiven. So it was in the law, but it was not something they practiced in the law. They didn't even practice the year of Jubilee. That was, you know, because you think, you know, well, am I going to forgive this person all their debt? That will wipe me out. You know, that's the way they were, they were thinking. Was. So they didn't even practice forgiveness, even though it was written in the law. So Jesus said, forgive us our sins just as we forgive everyone else. They did not have that power to forgive. It was not within them. So again, Jesus is directing them to something they need. And he says, forgive us our sins. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people are constantly going to God and begging every day for forgiveness. Oh, Lord, I sinned here. Please forgive me. Oh, Lord, I've, for, I've sinned here. Please forgive that. You know, so we're in this constant state of forgiveness. God does not want us to be in a constant state of forgiveness. We go to the elements of communion to receive that forgiveness. We've, he's already died. He's already went to the cross. Think about this. Jesus said from the cross of Calvary, truly, truly, I say to you, all sin, not just some sin, but all sin shall be forgiven the sons of man. And then from the cross of Calvary, he said, it is finished. It's done. Forgiveness has been, you know, it's been illustrated. It's been demonstrated. It's done. It's complete. And then, you know, John the Baptist even, when Jesus began his ministry, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. You see, he's taken away the sin of the world. And even in the Old Testament, he says, I shall cast your sin as far as the east is from the west. I will bury your sea, or sins in the sea of forgetfulness. The sin has already been dealt with. So now here's the question. <laughs> Here's the question. If the sin is already forgiven, then why must we go to God and ask for forgiveness? Search the Scriptures. Search the Scriptures for yourself. Don't just take Brian's opinion or Brian's words for this. It's not in my opinion. It's actually scriptural. Search the Scriptures. And nowhere outside of the Lord's Prayer in the New Testament do you see anyone or any instruction as far as saying, Go to God and ask for forgiveness. Nowhere. You know why? Forgiveness is already there. Sin is already forgiven. We just need to receive this forgiveness. We need to receive it. That's our struggle. That's, that's the problem we have. Why do we not receive it? Oh, Lord, because I've sinned here. Or I've done this. Or I've done that. I'm not worthy. You know, we, I've got to do something to clean myself up. No. He says, I've forgiven all sin. I've dealt with it. Your sin has been cast from you as far as the east is from the west. You're forgiven. 
That enables us to come into this relationship with Him. And once I understand how much I've been forgiven, it becomes relatively easy to forgive someone that's sinned against me. You see, He's pointing to them to something that was impossible in their mindset. How can I forgive everyone of everything? How, can they, how is that possible? And again, He's pointing to the power. And that's where we pick up in verse 9. I didn't mean to spend this much time in our intro, but we're going to anyway because it's important. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. You know, in James's go- or James's gospel, in James's, James's epistle, he says, you ask and you do not receive because you're asking with the wrong motives. You know, uh, you do not have because you do not, do not ask. And so what Jesus is saying here, keep on searching, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, and it will be open to you. You see, we might be going to God for a new job or a new career. And we may not immediately be receiving that new job or that new career. He says, well, just keep on knocking, keep on searching, keep on, you know, seeking. He, he, and maybe he's, we're praying about this relationship. Lord, I really want to be in this relationship with this gal. She's, she's beautiful. She's awesome. She'd be perfect to me or for me. Jesus says, keep on knocking, keep on searching, keep on seeking. Anyone who asks will receive, right? Now listen to what he goes on to say. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not... He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Lord, I really want to be in that relationship with that gal. She's perfect for me. I'm not going to give you a snake. You see that? We're asking for an egg or fish. He said, I'm not going to give you a snake. You see, that's why we're to keep on knocking, keep on searching, keep on asking. We may not be getting what we want because our Heavenly Father, our Daddy, loves us. And I'm not going to give a bad thing to my son. I'm an evil person. and I understand how to give a good gift to my child. And so just because I'm asking for that new career doesn't mean I'm going to receive that new career. Just because I'm asking for bread doesn't mean I'm going to receive bread. It might be a rock that I'm asking for. You know, I don't see. I don't have the bigger picture. I don't have a greater understanding that God does. He sees all things. He knows what's good for me. And so he says, keep on knocking, keep on searching, keep on asking. Just keep on. And what the end result? He's going to give us exactly what we need. He's going to give us everything that's going to satisfy and fulfill us. Because that's what we're seeking, right? We're seeking satisfaction and fulfillment. When I'm searching or looking to that gal or that person for a relationship, or if I'm looking to that career, or if I'm looking for whatever, that's what I'm searching for. That's what I'm wanting. That's what I'm desiring satisfaction and fulfillment. And so he says, keep on knocking, keep on. This is what he goes on to say. Verse 13. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit? That's who we need. That's our satisfaction and fulfillment. It's the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit, once He moves into our lives, He changes everything. He changes everything. And that sets the context for our following verses here. It's the Holy Spirit. He changes everything. I thought I wanted that career. That's not what I was looking for. I'm looking for the riches that I have in Christ Jesus. It comes by way of the Holy Spirit being in my heart, being in my life. He changes everything. So, continuing on as we press on. Verse 14. And he was casting out a demon, and it was mute. I like the King James Version. And the King James Version actually, it says dumb. And that becomes my life verse. Listen to here. When the demon had gone out, the dumb man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. <laughs> that's, my, that's my life verse. 
the dumb man spoke. And everybody's like amazed. Whoa! <laughs> so he says, uh, and, the, and the crowds were amazed. Verse 15. When some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Of course, the ruler of demons being uh, Satan. That's who he's actually referring to. He says, by the ruler of demons. Others, to test him, were demanding of him a sign from heaven. Prove this is of God and not of a demon. That's what he was actually saying. That's what the crowds were saying. Give us a sign to show us that this is from heaven and not from the pits of hell. Others, to test him, were demanding that he should give them a sign from heaven. But he knew their thoughts. So they weren't even actually saying this out loud. Jesus knew what they were thinking. He says, Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? If he's fighting against himself, how can his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out de- demons by Beelzebub. Now, and if, be- if I by be- Beelzebub or Satan cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out so that they will be your judges? So they will be your judges. Here. Remember the movie Liar, Liar? That's probably a bad reference, but <laughs> you remember that? You know, Jim Carrey's in the toilet or in the bathroom. He's got his head in the toilet, slamming against the, you know, and he's throwing himself up against the wall and he's punching himself in the in the face. Just think about how ridiculous that is. And that's what these guys were suggesting. Jim Carrey said, you know, somebody walks in the back, what are you doing? He said, I'm kicking my butt. <laughs> Satan, is Satan really going to fight against himself? Is Satan going to kick his own butt? No, it's ridiculous as he goes on to say. He said, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, He says, it doesn't say by the arm, the mighty arm of God, or by the hand of God. He says, by the finger of God. (laughs) I got my mind's eye, you know. Here's, here's, I don't want to use that one. I'll use this one. Here's Satan right here, and here's God. (laughs) He casts him out by the finger of God. You know, oftentimes we got in our mind that there's some sort of cosmic struggle that's going on. You know, it's Satan and God. We know that God's going to win, but man, it's going to be close. You know, there's this battle that's going on, this fight. He's a, <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, God and Satan are not counterparts. Jesus and Satan are not even counterparts. The, the counterpart might be Michael the archangel or Gabriel the angel. Because, but even in those cases, if you go to the book of Daniel, we see them beating Satan. You know, he's not as strong as... He has the power that we give to him. He has no strength. He has no power. Jesus has stripped him of all that power. Turn with me to uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. This is our daddy. Now, keep in mind, he's speaking to us of the power that we already have. When we're in a struggle, because we're not acknowledging or receiving that power. He says, when, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. We're forgiven. All of our transgression is forgiven. It's been dealt with. But yet we sit in this struggle each day. We're looking back on our life. And, you know, man, I, because I've done this or just because I've done that, I can't go to heaven. Or because I have this habit. I can't go to heaven because I think these thoughts, I, I can't go to heaven. We're worried about the future. We're, we're just, we're constantly condemning ourselves and in condemning ourselves, we're giving power to Satan. Jesus has dealt with it. There is no struggle any longer. There is no fight. He's won the battle. He says, having canceled out our certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way. It's been taken out of the way. Why are we moping? Why are we crying? Why are we mourning? It's the sin, the transgression has been taken out of the way. It's been cast as far as the east is from the west. Having nailed it to the cross. You know, we often hear of Saint Santa Claus making a list and checking it twice, right? Well, God has made a list of all of our sin, past, present, and future. He's checked it. 
And he nailed it to the cross of Calvary. It's been done. It's been dealt with. It's a certificate of death has been canceled out. There is no certificate of death. It's been dealt with. It's gone. <laughs> We're going to heaven, right? We can celebrate, right? Our sin has been dealt with. See, the only power that Satan now has is the power that we give to him. You know, he's a roaring lion, but he's been defamed. You know, he's even been declawed. He has no power. Oh, yes. And he's taken out of the way. When he did, had disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public display of them, a public dis, a, a spectacle of them. You know, when a Roman emperor conquered a, a kingdom, he'd take everyone, you know, his, his, his mighty men would march into this, the kingdom first. In between him and the mighty man, because he'd be in the, in the back here, in between the two, there would be all these people who had been in, in shackled in, in chains. And oftentimes they'd march through the city naked. He, 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 you know, he, he's, he's exposed them. That's what Jesus has done upon the cross of Calvary. He's exposed Satan. He's made a public display of him. He's, he's dealt with the sin. It's the finger of God. He's just nothing. <laughs> Continuing on. When a strong man... Uh, yes. Listen carefully. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house... And his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distributes his plunder. So he, 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 he disarms him and he distributes the plunder. And of course, Jesus already said that it's ridiculous to think that Satan is going to be casting out Satan by the power of Satan. That, that, that's ridiculous. It's, it's liar, liar. I mean, that's, that's the image that we have here. It's, that's a ridiculous thought. And he's been talking about the finger of God. So who is the strong man here? It's Jesus. It's God. He's the strong man. He goes in. He disarms. He distributes the plunder. And he says, he, And he who is not with me is against me. And who who does not gather with me scatters. You're either for him or you're against him. There's no middle ground here. He says, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places. Keep this in mind. What does water represent through Scripture? The Word of God. So imagine someone coming into, into a Sunday morning service, right? And, or a Sunday evening service. Maybe it's next Sunday night we're going to have this Awesome worship, so someone gets saved. He comes in, and you know, and the, the demons are expelled. You know, in his life, these things have been holding him in bondage. All that's been expelled, but we don't see that person again, right? There's this, the enemy. He's not going into a place where the light of God is. He goes into waterless places, right, where the word of God is not in a person. He goes to those places. So he goes. The image here. Is this person gets delivered, he gets saved. And now this demon that was once in him is going about and around. And then, reading on, he says, and not finding any, I'm sorry, yeah, water some places, seeking rest, and not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. I'll go back from where I was cast out. Maybe the strong man is gone. And when it comes, it finds the house, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they go in and live there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. It's because he goes back, and this person has not embraced Jesus, you see. He's not brought Jesus into his life. He's not been studying the Scripture. And so now he's left wide open. And then, so this demon comes back, and his first state is even worse than the, than the last. Or the last state is worse than the first state. You know, there's no water. There's no water. There was, this person had not embraced Jesus. Now, keep this in mind. You know, we've got an awesome president right now. He's doing the things that he said he would do. 
right? You know, because we oftentimes, we want to go out and protest this. We want to protest that. We want to protest the other. And that's all good. We want to, we want to share with society, you know, what, what God's will is. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But here's the deal. Let's say, suppose that President Trump, he, he uh, makes abortion illegal. You know, he makes uh, homosexual marriage illegal. Let's, let's say he does away, he, he puts, on, puts in the court system the, 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 the most conservative judges there are. Judges that embrace the Bible. And they do all these great things for our country. But here's the deal. What's going to happen when President Trump leaves? What's, what, what, what do you suppose is going to happen if you get a, a, a liberal judge or a liberal president sitting in the White House? And that liberal president, is a, you know, he's, he serves, you know, two terms and the next, and his vice president comes in, he, ter- he serves two terms. And so now we've got a president, the policy's in place for 16 years. What do you suppose is going to happen in those 16 years? Everything's going to go back the way it was. Because you see, rules, regulations, and laws does not change our society. Only Jesus can change our society. Unless we change the heart of this country, it doesn't matter who our president is. This country is going to hell in a handbasket unless we change the heart of people. The laws will never do anything. You know, Saddam Hussein was one of the most ruthless dictators in, in Iraq in all of their history. He was this dictator and no one dare step out of line because, you know, they'd get their head chopped off or they'd get a beating. But once he left Iraq, when, he, when his kingdom fell... Guess what the people did? They started lying, they started cheating, they started raping, they started murdering because that dictator was now out of the way. There was a lawless society. And so they just went nuts because that was what was already in them, you see. Rape, murder, incest. All those things were already in their hearts. Even though law restrained them for a period, the people were still evil. See, it's the heart that has to be changed. And that's exactly what Jesus is pointing to here. It's the heart. What do we leave off in verse 13? The Holy Spirit. He's what makes the difference. While Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which which nursed you. But he says, On the contrary, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. So he's referring them right back to what he said earlier. He says, you know, the, the, someone had come in and says, your mother and your, your brothers and your sisters are looking for you. He says, who are my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? But those who hear the word of God. So this woman is crying out, blessed is Mary, your mother. He says, no. Blessed are those who are in my family now. Those who hear and observe the word of God. That's my family. Those are my brothers. Those are my mother. That that is my sisters. And the crowds were increasing. He began to say, this generation is a wicked generation. Because they don't believe, you see. They don't believe. It's a wicked generation. I can't think uh, of Cain and Abel. Abel believed. And he's bringing this sacrifice that attention to the garden. Cain wanted, that, wanted to be in that paradise once more. But he brought a sacrifice. And it, just as Abel had brought a sacrifice, he brought a sacrifice. But what was the difference in that sacrifice? Belief. Yeah, he's, he was trying to work his way into the presence of God. This generation is a wicked generation. It seeks for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. They're saying, give us a sign. How many signs does Jesus need to perform? He's raised the dead, right? He's raised the dead. He's he's walked on water. He's turned water into wine. How many signs do they need? You see, they're looking for the sign from heaven. That's what they're seeking, a sign from heaven, a sign from God. And God had already said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, your sin will be dealt with. I will deal with your sin. And so they're saying, give us a sign. And Jesus said, there's only one sign that you're really going to get. There's only one sign that you're going to understand. And so that's when I am beaten and then go to the cross of Calvary and then buried and rose again. That's where, where, where Jonah was. He was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights. And when he came out, 
There was a great sign for the Ninevites, weren't they? His body was bleached white. He had no hair, no, no eyelashes, no eyebrows. And he's going through the city, you know, 30 day, or 40 days and then judgment. 40 days. He, wasn't, he didn't even have the attitude. You know, he, he had an attitude, should I, should I say. He didn't care about the people. He just said, judgment is coming. And the people of Nineveh repented. He says, for just as Jonah became a sign for the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. When Jesus comes forth from the grave, people are going to say, oh, this is of God. This is of God. My sin is forgiven. See, that's why Jesus came to earth. That's why God came down, entered into Mary, and came out from her in the form of a man. And then he was beaten, and then he, you know, he's butchered, he was filleted, and then he was nailed to that cross, he was buried, and then he came forth. This is your sign. This is the proof that this is my son, that, this is, that, that I've forgiven sin. He says, the queen of Sheba, or the queen of South, I'm sorry, will rise up with the men of this generation and at the judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. She came from as far, you know, she came out of Africa to hear Solomon, who was speaking forth wisdom. Here Jesus is speaking forth wisdom to all of his people, the people of Jerusalem, the people of Israel, and they're rejecting him. He says, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it. You know, I've been trying to remember certain things, and I've got them written down right here. <laughs> and I just went, I forgot I had them here. But anyway, <laughs> see, there's a lot of things that's going on in this mind up here. <laughs> and it sometimes just blurts out, and I don't mean to, for it to. But anyway, the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. So Nineveh was this ruthless people. These were cruel, cruel people. You know, they, they would actually skin people alive just for fun. They, they, and when they, when they crucified people, they'd put them on the end of a stake, you know, and then the, the, the stake would go up their rectum, out their mouth. And then after, you know, they plunder a city and they killed all the men, they take their, after they, after they skin them and, and then burn all the flesh, they'd take the skulls, the skeletons, and pile them up as a warning to everyone else. Hey, when the Ninevites come, you better be watching. You better be careful. They were cruel. They were evil. But they repented. And Jonah, who's going through the city, who really didn't care for the Ninevites, 40 days of judgment, 40 days and then judgment, they were repenting. And, and, and here God is, or Jesus, he's coming here with kindness, with grace, with compassion, with love. And these people are refusing to receive this gospel message. He says, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. No one is, after lighting a lamp, puts it away in a cellar, nor under a basket, but on a lampstand, so that those who enter may see the light. So, who's the light of the world? Jesus. God has sent us Jesus. God has sent His Son to shine brightly so that people may hear, so that people may see and hear and receive and be saved. But why aren't the people hearing it? Why are they not receiving it? Verse 34. The answer is here. The eye is the lamp of your body. And when your eye is clear, your whole body is is also full of light. But when it is bad, your body is also full of darkness. Then watch out that the then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. What kind of light is in you? If therefore your whole body is full of light with no dark part in it, it will be wholly illumined. And as when the light illuminates, illuminates <laughs> you in, it, with its rays, lights you up with its rays. See, again, we're, we're going, going back to the traditional teaching, right? Uh, this, the way, we, way I, brought, I was brought up to read these verses 
It says, you know, that the eye is a portal for the body. And whatever's coming in through the eyes is going to dictate your beliefs. How many has heard that? Be, be careful, little eye, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Well, there is some truth to that, and I, I don't want to discredit that totally because we do need to be careful what we're seeing and what we're hearing. That's not what this is talking about. You know, for example, when I talked through this the first time, the week before, there was these two kids that went, you know, they got arrested. And then they got arrested because they're running over people in their car that were on the sidewalks in the streets. They were driving along and running over people. Because there was a video game out there that was about, you know, running over people. And so they thought, well, if we hit these people and kill them, all we have to do is hit the reset button. You know, <laughs> that's where they got into. Because they was just sitting and watching these video games, and these video games were detic- dictating their actions. And here's another thing. If you're sitting watching porn all day, what's going to be on your mind? Porn, right? But here's the question, and this is where I want to get to. It, why would you be watching the porn? That's the question. Why would I be watching that to begin with? And it goes to what's on the inside. That's what this is about, you see. You understand, Paul would say, be in the world, but not of the world, right? He would say, uh, I wrote down a couple here, and I want to get back to them. He said, uh, walk by faith and not by sight. He, 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 the, in 1 Corinthians, he wrote that we're not to associate with the people, immoral people. But he said, I was not talking about the immoral people of the world, because if I was talking about the immoral people of the world, you'd have to be taken out of the world. So if I'm to walk by sight or I'm sorry, by faith and not by sight, if seeing is dictating my life, then how can I possibly walk by faith and not by sight? You can't. So that, that's contradictive then. What, what Jesus is saying here and what Paul says would contradict one another. And how can, if, if, be, you know, if the things of this world is dictating my heart, then how can I be in the world but not of the world? Paul says be in the world but not of the world. How is that possible? If Jesus is saying what I see is going to dictate my life, be, that the, the, everything that's coming in through the eyes, the eyes are the portal of the body, then that cannot be true. See, he's not saying that what you see changes you. He's saying what's, what's in you changes how you view everything. It changes my view. It's, it changes how I see. You see, if that light is in me, if the light of God is in me, it's going to change my perspective of things. It's going to change my perspective about that relationship that I've been desiring. You see, he says, keep on knocking, keep on searching, keep on... Get, you pray for the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit changes everything. The, you know, once the Holy Spirit moves in, it's going to change my perspective of money. It's going to change my perspective of alcohol. These things that once had a hold of me are no longer going to be able to chain me down because my view of things have changed by way of the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, he says, that's why he says, he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. Now, it, what he says, there's a, he says, be sure that that's not darkness that that's in you. You see, if my life is all about religious practices, if religion is in me, then that's going to be changing my perspective of other people. If I've been living by this religion... I'm going to be looking at people and judging them because they're not living the way that I'm living. I'm going to be looking down my nose. That, well, you should be like me. I've really worked hard to arrive to this position, you see. So you need to look like me. And if the, if the things of this world is in me, if lust, if immorality is in me, then when I look at people, when I look at women, how am I going to view them from what is in me, from the darkness that is in me? He's saying the eye is the lamp. It's only a reflection. If you're looking out, it becomes a light as to what is in you. It's not for you to use to judge other people. What do you see? What, are you, what do you see in that person? What do you see in that drug? What do you see in that alcohol? It's a reflection of what's in me. It becomes a gauge. How am I living my life? How am I per, per, uh, observing these things? Is it of the flesh? Or is it of the Spirit? That's why Paul gave us those two lists. The, the fruit of the Spirit and the deeds of the flesh. The eye is the portal. You see, not the portal, but the, the lamp. 
It's dictating what's in you. So now when I begin to pray, I begin to pray for the Holy Spirit. I think it's drugs that I want. I think it's power that I want. I think it's an image that I'm seeking. It's the Holy Spirit. That's what I truly want and desire. And that's why it's so important, you see, to be in this constant relationship. First of all, what we've got to do is change our image of God. You know, sometimes we're looking at him as a judge, as a dictator. But he's love us. He loves us. He's for us. He's not against us. So I need to take these things to God. That's why I'm to confess my sin. You know, we're often thinking we've got to beg for forgiveness. So he says, no, simply confess this sin. Take it to God. Come in agreement with him. And he's faithful and righteous to forgive you. He's already forgiven all your sin. You can't hide these things to him. So take them to him. He's your daddy. He wants to bless you. He loves you. He cares for you. So I take these things to him. And, when, and the more I do this, the more I confess my sin, the more I take my wants and my desires to him, the more he changes me on the inside. He washes the inside of the cup. And the more he changes me on the inside, the more my view of things, my perspective of things are going to be changing. And if I'm not embracing him today, if I'm not in his word today, guess what's going to happen? The seven demons are going to be coming in greater than the first, you see. And you think you've been delivered, you know, from that drug? And it's, praise God, you've been delivered. But if you're not embracing Jesus, the matter's going to get even worse. You're going to find yourself in a greater and greater bondage. Amen. Let's pray right there. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for saving us. All our hope is truly in him. And so, Lord, we thank you for him. We thank you for acknowledging or for dealing with our sin. We, we acknowledge that has been taken completely out of the way. We can just enjoy the freedom that we have in your grace, in your mercy, in your love today. May we begin to experience all the riches that we have in Christ Jesus. It's in your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen.